From the vistas of the Grand Tetons, we welcome you to Lost River Legends, our motto, Ex Tenebris, Latin for Out from the Shadows. Here we discuss Bigfoot, skinwalkers, UFOs, aliens, and other paranormal topics. We want you to join us in seeking that which is hidden and obscured from our view. We hope you enjoy the show and encourage you to reach out to us at lostriverlegends at gmail.com to share your story and leave us a message. You can also reach us at lostriverlegends.com to find access to all of our episodes, guest bios, show notes, and our blog. Prepare yourself and get settled in and comfortable as your hosts, James and Brett, enter into the realm of shadows. Enjoy the show. Do you happen to be one of the recipients of Donald Rumsfeld's black budget of $2.7 trillion, we could really use your help. If not, we could still use your help. Please visit patreon.com slash Lost River Legends. Thank you. One of the best ways you can support this podcast is by submitting a positive review on Apple Podcasts. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome to Lost River Legends. I'm one of your hosts, James. We have an excellent show for you. We've been looking forward to this for a really long time. We had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum in Pocatello at his ISU lab, and it was an excellent experience getting to know him and and to spend some time with him in person. Whatever your level of interest in the subject of Sasquatch, you'll find this interview to be interesting. Thank you and enjoy the show. Folks, well, we're here this evening with Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, and we're in his uh, in his office at ISU, and he's been very gracious to be able to take some time and meet with us and show us around um, his lab and show us some of the different developments that are are taking place, and also to just chat about the fun subject of Sasquatch. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you. Glad to be a part of it. We were just talking about um, actually uh, some of the David Pilates um, books, and he kind of brings up the DNA analysis that he did with Dr. Melba mm-hmm. Ketchum. Uh, what are what are some of your thoughts on that Sasquatch genome project? And um, have you had any contact with Melba Ketchum or any outreach there? Oh, sure. I've been in touch with Melba from the start. Uh, from her first introduction to the Bigfoot community, in fact, which took place in Jefferson, Texas. So, and and prior to that, I had interactions with her involving a a witness who thought he had potentially skeletal remains of a young Sasquatch that he had sent to her and then had never gotten satisfaction, uh, never gotten any report or results or response to his requests for return of the skeleton, the cranial fragment. As it turned out, it was it was the cranium of a small mammal. It wasn't a, a Sasquatch by any means, but um, shortly thereafter, she appeared at the uh, conference there in Texas and, and was clearly sizing up the crowd at the time, and David Politis gravitated towards her, obviously, and uh, as, as a result of that came, uh, became involved with some of her initiatives. Um, the bottom line is there's just absolutely no reliable results from her study, period. Despite, and, and David would take strong exception with me on that point, <laughs> but, um, but there just isn't. Um, what, you know, from any angle you want to examine that undertaking, whether it was you know, the collection of the data, the, the inordinate um, and uniform success of every single sample she received being Sasquatch, which is just uh, inconceivable, quite honestly. Um, the results and the interpretation of the results, the involvement with Justin Schmea that I had intimate contact with. Um, uh, from shortly after the collection of his piece of hide and had an on-site uh, uh, 
description of his encounter, his alleged encounter with a, a Sasquatch and, and two offspring, two young ones. I mean, the whole thing is, we could spend the whole night talking about this one question, but uh, it certainly wouldn't be time well spent. But, but again, the, uh, there's just no reliable data. Probably the best review of her, of her uh, paper that resulted from all of that is that by Haskell Hart and it, that appears in the Relic Hominoid Inquiry, the journal that I edit, and uh, very thorough and, and very diplomatic. In fact, I had to kind of push him to be even more uh, um, overt, more, more precise in his conclusions because I wanted to leave, uh, 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 make it very clear as to what, what the result of that study uh, was. Uh, was there any reliable data to be had? And, and there just simply wasn't. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a, a major distraction, has been a major distraction because of the very unprofessional, unscientific nature of that whole enterprise from the notion of uh, a hybrid species, um, the suggestion that uh, there were close affinities in those sequences to uh, um, a giant lemur. <laughs> Uh, I mean, just one thing after another, the whole charade of purchasing a journal, a legitimate scientific journal, renaming it, rolling back the ticker to volume one, page one, in order to self-publish your paper. I mean, the whole story was just as, it was just so incongruous as, as one could imagine. So probably best to just leave it at that. It sounds like <laughs> uh, between you know, all the different methods and, and, uh, you know, in pursuit of science and answers that it fell short. I think that's probably the best way to, to sum that up. And it's unfortunate because we were talking um, a little bit earlier about how it's, it's a matter of finding out what these things are not before finding out what they are. In some ways, yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, that actually goes back to some of the, the basic philosophies of the of the methodology of science that it proceeds by falsification. You, you try to knock the legs out from under a particular hypothesis, find the exception, which is often more practical than trying to prove every case, every possible conceivable case. And so if you can demonstrate that exception, then you then have something to take back to the drawing board and, and regroup and revise and repropose a, a more um, uh, elaborate hypothesis in order to accommodate the observations that are made. But no, this had nothing to do with that process. <laughs> Unfortunately, thank you for, for going into that, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. You oh, know, no, I have, I have no nice. problems. I mean, I, I, it's uncomfortable for, for Dr. Ketchum <laughs> right. and maybe for David Politis, but, uh, um, it's not uncomfortable for me. I mean, it's, it's frustrating for me. Uh, but uh, no, I, I have no no problem. It's uh, it's all very clear to me uh, what transpired, how it transpired, and what the motiv what the actual motivations were. For, for me, it's you always want to be able to <clears throat> at the end of the day say, "Ha ha, proof!" Right? Well, sure. Well, yeah, we we're looking this thing that's solid, mm -hmm. and that's what's really hard about science is it's always got new methods and new. Uh, conjectures and new hypotheses mm -hmm. and it's like you said about disproving knocking the legs out from under mm -hmm. and then still once you get to that conclusion redrawing that hy mm -hmm. hypothesis and re refining mm -hmm. uh, and getting getting more uh, as solid as possible but as far mm -hmm. as you know can you chisel it on a on a piece of marble and say this is the way it is 100 mm -hmm. percent at the end of the day that's the challenge well, and, and it's uh, within a, a, the community of, of Bigfoot enthusiasts, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of, of non-scientists who don't understand the way in which scientific data are dealt with. And so they're extremely motivated and, and hopeful for an outcome and may have preconceptions that uh, may find some, you know, validation or vindication in a particular hypothesis or a particular uh, interpretation of the data 
And so it becomes a very polarizing phenomenon. And you have people who become passionately adherent to a particular interpretation, regardless of the data. I mean, even, right. even if they're able to in, understand or interpret the data themselves, which they usually are not, and so they're relying on the expertise of other other people, either the principal investigator, in this case, Melba Ketchum, or expert reviewers, you know, such as myself and Haskell and, and other people that have uh, taken a, a, an open-minded, objective look. You know, I mean, there was at one point, it was rumored that she was um, dissing me because I was simply jealous because I wasn't involved with the project and so forth. I hadn't participated. And, and so I was um, left out and, and nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, if she had conclusive evidence that vindicates all of the previous work that I have done, all right. the years of investigation I've put in, I would be doing back handsprings. And then the real work begins because just an acknowledgement of the existence of species is just the start of, right. of coming to an understanding of it and understanding how we interact or, or will interact as a species with it, uh, what our stewardship will be, and you know, so on. So, you know, I I would be delighted if her conclusions were correct. And it's not that I disagree with her, uh, her findings because they don't agree with my preconceptions. I mean, I'm looking at the data. Right. I'm open to the possibilities, but boy, you have to be able to provide evidence and, and an understanding of the data that, that you're presenting, of the hypothesis you're presenting. And there were just so many. I mean, since I was involved with it behind the scenes, I knew the players before the pieces were placed on the board um, just to see the way that unfolded. I mean, I, I know much more than, than most people looking from the outside in. And, uh, and that was very telling, very revealing. And frustrating, I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> now, when you're um, you're talking about um, people who are Bigfoot enthusiasts being uh, very excited and very passionate, um, that seems to have contributed to something called pareidolia. Mm -hmm. And can you can you talk about how those consequences of pareidolia are contributing to the, mm -hmm. the false reports and right. how that actually ends up kind of playing more into the pop culture, um, you know, you can't prove it kind of a thing and right. pushing it into the, into that realm. Right. Well, let me, let me preface my comment by, by just saying, I, I'm certainly not, do not want to appear to stereotype all Bigfoot enthusiasts as, as uh, passionate and naive and amateur and so forth. That's not the case at all. I mean, there are individuals that, that uh, are working with, different skill sets, uh, uh, varying skill sets. And, and some of those are extremely talented and qualified and skilled in a variety of things from, from uh, you know, audio recording and, and videography and photography and, and tracking, etc. natural history. There's a, uh, there, there are many citizen scientists which is what I would hope all Bigfoot enthusiasts would aspire to. Um, so back to uh, pareidolia, uh, pareidolia, I can never pronounce it right, <laughs> um, is the notion of, of perceiving patterns in random data. So how does that relate to Bigfoot? Well, for example, my, one of my uh, skill sets and, and uh, areas of particular interest our footprints, or is the footprint data set. And um, when individuals uh, go out into the woods, oftentimes they see a footprint in a random shape, or not a random shape, but in a shape, an, a, an unassociated shape, I should say. An un, um, in other words, uh, there's the hint of toes, or there's the, the vague outline of a footprint that. It, uh, that uh, takes shape in a pothole or a mud puddle or a scuff mark by some other animal. Or there is the suggestion of toes, uh, whether it's the toes of a bear or whether it's the rounded 
um, back end of the hoof of a deer or an elk, um, superimposed, creating a series. That, that's uh, one area where seeing a pattern in when it's not really there, um, or when it doesn't reflect uh, um, the object you're you're concluding, then uh, is one area. Another is is uh, you know the infamous blob squatch, right. the the vague or ambiguous photo that shows a shadow or a pattern in the leaves that one's mind then interprets as a face or a figure, and uh, sometimes even to the complete disregard for scale. I had one enthusiastic witness who showed me this enlargement of a photo and uh, you know there there did appear to be this this vague little figure standing there amongst the foliage but the scale seemed a little peculiar and I says you know doesn't something strike you as odd here and, and I said uh, uh, do you have the original photo? And she says, oh, yes. And she pulls it out. And it was the enlargement of this little spot underneath a bush. And the, the alleged figure would have only been about five inches tall. And I said, well, you realize that this figure would only be five inches? Oh, yes. They're small like that sometimes. <laughs> that was her response. <laughs> and so, I mean, what do you do with that? <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, it, this is why it's so important to, to uh, develop this objective and um, meth meth um, methodical approach to the collection of data. And so if you do happen to see something like that, um, and in many cases it's after the fact, but if you can return to that site, take a picture of the same exact um, scene from the same vantage point, so you have a before and after shot to see if, if it is just the action of a shadow or a, or the um, you know configuration of leaves and twigs. There was one really famous one from the Patterson-Gimlin film uh, that uh, got the attention of, of Robert Morgan, who's you know has some notoriety in this field, and and uh, I remember on a radio show he was going on and on about how there was another figure in that frame could clearly be seen standing in the tree line and on the on the uh, program's web page they had a picture posted that he'd sent in well it was a, a very late generation uh, copy and it was very uh, unclear you know, it wasn't sharp in the least well I've got an 11 by 14 black and white print up there that I purchased from Roger Patterson back in 1968 or 69 when I was a member of the Northwest Research Association and it's a very early print presumably from the original film stock so I was able to to scan that little spot in the tree line that he had drawn attention to and sent it in because what he was seeing as lights and shadows of a face were the leaves and twigs and stems of of the tree right there and, and it was all too clear in the in the sharper image um, but that uh, that was a, apparently a bitter pill to swallow <laughs> yeah yeah well it's interesting because you know there's that whole you want you want to believe you want to see mm -hmm. so then the the brain shortcuts sometimes you right know? and people and that that passion that drive to have that can manipulate that's well, of really, course that's really fascinating and right. i did not know that that could apply to other sets of of data across the board so yeah. um, you were showing us earlier what was obviously a fake from a, a board pushing off and the toes making an impression in the mud mm -hmm. and you know someone stumbling on that that wants to believe oh, sure that's that's authentic that's as real as it gets mm -hmm. but you got to get it you know, you have over 300 samples to compare it to, right. plus the analyses on each of those different impressions. Right. So you have kind of just different frame of reference than someone that's excited about it. Right. So that's that's what's really cool about um, the work that you're doing here. I think that um, not a lot of other people can say that they're they're going to the lengths that you are as far as 
collecting the data, cataloging it. And now you've got, you've got new scientists, up and coming scientists that are training in the same field from what I hear. Well, I hope so. I hope so. I, I'm, I'm still waiting for some of those to step, step up. I'm afraid, and I talked about this in, in other circumstances, I'm afraid there's, that, that we're going to have about a 10 to 15 year lag. By that, I mean, um, I'm, uh, the, the paradigm shift that has occurred has finally, uh, in anthropology, has finally taken root sufficiently that the upcoming generation of students are not steeped in the preconceptions of what can and can't exist. You know, just 20 years ago, the idea that, that there were multiple species of hominid across the landscape uh, at the same time that Homo sapiens was finding its way in its early um, origins was just inconceivable. I mean, it was thought that, you know, those just fell to the wayside. They became extinct and, and we usurped and, and moved on to be the dominant species, the only species on the planet. Well, now we know that many of these species have persisted until much more recently than had ever been imagined before. And the notion that there could be something alongside us today is no longer an impossible uh, proposition. It may be deemed improbable, but it's no longer impossible because there's a, you know, seven million years of precedent now to fall back on. And so I see evidence of, of young students now who are quite intrigued by the question, but they're gagged. I mean, they're still, the gatekeepers are still the old guard and that shadow has cast a, yeah. <laughs> a long ways in, up into the present. And so until they get tenure, and have established their reputations and uh, their records and can then turn their attention to this question from a position of authority and job security, um, relative job security, uh, they're, they're essentially gagged. It'll be just closet conversations with me behind the scenes. And I have those ongoing yeah. with a, a variety of people on both ends of the spectrum, even some that are senior uh, professors who don't really want to be associated with this subject matter publicly uh, for various reasons and young ones young ones who have come forward and shared their enthusiasm and interest so I've got to I've got to stick around <laughs> got for to, another decade. You've got to bridge the gap. That's right. That's what it feels like. Someone to hand the, the That's right. <laughs> you know, looking back at, at that transition between Dr. Krantz and, and myself, it was really uh, fortuitous and, and quite serendipitous the way circumstances uh, literally aligned the stars such that I was in a position uh, and was naive enough to take the baton from him, <laughs> even before I had tenure. And, uh, you know, it's made my life really interesting over the past 20 years, as you can imagine. I bet. But uh, it's been very fulfilling, and, and it's fascinating. I mean, I can't imagine a more interesting uh, question to pursue in this day and age. Uh, uh, so. That's awesome. Um, you know, along these lines, are there are there any developing methods in the scientific in scientific research or technical ad advancements that might increase our understanding of Sasquatch or further help to uh, establish that it's a real thing. yes yes I, I think that there's two principal thrusts that will take us to the next level and one of those is environmental DNA um, you know that really hit the headlines when researchers excavating sediments in a cave in Siberia that had no evidence of occupation by hominins still revealed the DNA of Denisovans. So another sample, another example of, of Denisovan DNA. Um, that really showed that there was a potential to use that tool to explore biodiversity in a way that has never been undertaken before. Uh, and those technologies have continued to improve and become more, more um, accessible and more fundable, more uh, uh, affordable. Uh, the 
there, there are two, two aspects of that, that that will be intriguing. One is it may allow us to do an end run around the obstacle we've experienced with hair analysis. One of the uh, seemingly consistent uh, characteristics of Sasquatch hair or hair attributed to Sasquatch is the lack of a cellular medulla, that central core that consists of stacked um, cell remains that uh, where one finds the mitochondria and nuclear genes that are sequenceable. In a hair, in a presumed Sasquatch hair that lacks a growing follicle, a dividing follicle, or um, a, a skin tag, you know, from a pulled out hair, one that has just been shed with a quiescent root, uh, there's precious little DNA to be found. And so frequently the sample won't yield any DNA. Or if it does, and, and it's not easily identifiable some other form of wildlife, it most likely uh, will be identified as human. And either that's either rationalized as contamination from handling by the investigator, or that it's just a human hair that's been, you know, and some human hairs do lack a cellular medulla. Um, but there's a third possibility, and that is the, the potential for a false negative, I'd call it. That is falsely or incorrectly concluding that it's not Sasquatch hair when in fact it is, but we just haven't sequenced enough DNA to identify those rare distinctions that would differentiate it from us. Because if we're talking about an early hominin, you know, the chances of, of, of remarkably uh, similar, uh, nearly identical DNA is really high. Chimpanzees, you know, depending on where you, you're, you're looking, anywhere from 96 to you know 98 99% identity with humans so so we could be talking about a species that has 99.5 99.75% identity with humans and it may be that looking at a single gene especially a mitochondrial gene just won't have enough information to differentiate it and i discussed this with a number of uh, investigators a number a oh, number of geneticists who aren't directly involved with this with this uh, question of Sasquatch, but when describing this scenario, they've concurred and they said, "Oh yes, you should you should be sequencing the entire mitochondrial genome and a selection of nuclear genes as well." So that's a little bit pricey, and then we have to combine that with the fact that if these creatures are as rare as I believe they are, then what are the odds that we're going to find DNA from that moving needle in a haystack? in an environment where DNA, you know, doesn't tend to uh, survive as well as it would in, in a protected and stable environment like a, a cave in uh, cave sediments. So that's one though, I think eDNA e is, is the wave of the future. And then two, I think that we need to expand our reach that the, uh, you know, unless there's, well, we need to expand our reach. We, we can't in individually cover enough terrain uh, just hiking and walking uh, compare by comparison to these creatures in their environment. And so to expand that reach, drone technologies, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, more and more the multi-copters have improved so that their airtime, the big limiting factor has been airtime. 18 minutes just doesn't do it. When 10 minutes of that is there and back, so you've got eight minutes to conduct a survey, and so you're, you're you know you're only extending your reach, um, you know, a half mile, a mile maybe at, at the most if right. you can even get it out that far. Um, but uh, there are other devices, helium drones. We've we've talked about or looked at a couple of uh, possible initiatives. It's not an easy solution. There are a lot of technical aspects. Plus, you know, we'd like to fly at night. We'd like to fly um, with sufficient camera uh, equipment to and and uh, ability to broadcast that, so we can um, uh, follow it live and have GPS location, so that we can send a, a ground you know site verification team immediately into an area where we think we have a potential hit to look for trace or physical evidence or an actual encounter. 
So I think those will be the other ways. And then if there's any kind of breakthroughs in um, camera trap technologies that improve the stealth capabilities, um, and, and that can be demonstrated with other uh, forms of top predators, cougars, uh, coyotes and wolves that have already demonstrated and in, in the scientific literature there are publications documenting their ability to avoid, to actively avoid camera traps. So, so whether it's EM emission or light leakage or uh, human scent or just the novelty of an object in their territory it's just like if you know if someone leaves a box on your front porch it doesn't take very long for you to notice that it's there yeah even if it does get slid behind the potted plant you know yeah that's, so that's a really in interesting me mention there um you know we always think about um you know fleer and the different mm -hmm. technologies one of these days when one of these things are going to capture mm -hmm. a really stunning great photo sure you know and that's going to be you know some some proof positive or some right. move in the right direction but uh when you're combining these different technologies and moving them forward that sounds like it's there's it's a promising future mm -hmm. I, I was just thinking about the drone alone right that doesn't exist yet that needs to be developed and well, exactly and uh exactly exp expanded on right the idea right and and the regulations are becoming more stringent not more lenient right. uh given the increase in popularity and so uh that may be that well and those those kind of hurdles can be gotten around i mean un under the auspices of a research project uh, i'll have more leeway than um than perhaps just your average Joe off the street. But another one other dimension too that, that worthy of mention here that we touched on earlier, and that is um, citizen science. That if if we have uh, a core of of investigators who have schooled themselves in the natural history of their region, if they're good outdoorsmen, if they if they have a concept of research that goes beyond sitting around a campfire in a lawn chair, <laughs> then we might be able to get reliable data. I mean, this is, you know, you, you mentioned the FLIR and the night vision and so forth, and <clears throat> those are great and, and invaluable technologies at night. And I, and I don't think we have to limit our investigations to just the nighttime either. That's the other thing. We have this misconception I think that's grown out of all of the Bigfoot expeditions that the only time anything's going to happen is at night, and you have to stay up till the wee hours of the night to, to have a, a you know, uh, an encounter. Patterson was, and Gimlin were on that sandbar in the afternoon, not at, not right. in the wee hours of the morning. Lunch so time, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but but just emphasizing that that there is is this unescapable factor of chance that most of the uh, reports that we could sit here and talk about most of the encounters are completely serendipitous there are very few encounters that are intentional i mean even the patterson given intention uh, in, encounter happened after two and a half weeks of real hard hard slogging through those woods and driving the roads and riding the creek beds on horseback didn't just happen on the weekend they got there and so um, that's where the odds are greatly enhanced by more and more uh, citizen scientists out there applying good skills, good techniques, and uh, objective, discriminating uh, investigation of evidence. You know, ask yourself: Is is this piece of evidence reliable? Am I? Am I reading too much into it? Is my expectation, uh, you know, coloring my interpretation? Will this, is it substantial enough? And even if you've convinced yourself objectively that this is good evidence, is it substantial enough that it's going to add significantly to the dialogue, to the, to the argument? Is it going to help tip the scales? It's like with so many of these blob squatch photos, these uh, that, that people get all up in a dander, their dander up over, arguing back and forth, even if they convince themselves 
the the bar has been set so high by the Patterson Gimlin film <laughs> that uh, that these others uh, of of such marginal quality that you know if it requires that much when someone sends me a picture and I write back and have to ask where's Waldo because I'm not going to spend my afternoon trying to second guess which of those little uh, patterns of lights and darks that they've interpreted as a Bigfoot. That doesn't do anybody any good. So Yeah, it's kind of just adding more more mud to the water. So to well, speak. right. And then the detractors just simply harp on that as, as these amateurs grasping at straws. They're trying to, trying to bend every possible bump in the night, every possible overturned rock, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Sasquatch evidence. Well, and you've got the people that mean well. Oh, yes. And then you've got the people that don't mean well. Right. Which leads me to my next question. How, what kind of impact do deliberate hoaxers have yeah. on your work? Well, unfortunately, and, and uh, well, let me say, first say, fortunately, I think the blatant outright hoaxing is relatively rare. Um, there's a lot more just simple misidentification and overinterpretation. But what happens is the hoaxing, as I see it, feeds into the media. Because the media gloms onto a story. A debunking story always gets carried. Or uh, in anything else, it's always wink, wink, nod, nod. It's always, a, you know, the wrap-up human interest story. And, and it may even devolve into hilarity there on, on, on the set with the anchors laughing and joking about it. Uh, rarely taking the subject seriously or giving it a serious consideration. And so that media then also influences the members of the scientific community who just passively uh, bump into that kind of coverage because they're not actively educating themselves on the subject matter. And, you know, they're human, so those kinds of uh, stimuli have an impact. <laughs> and so... Um, so there's that cascade, because then I'll get people who come up to me, colleagues, who say, but I heard that, well, you heard wrong, <laughs> you know, why don't you, you're a scientist, aren't you going to look, go and check the primary source and not rely on a secondary source of data? Um, so that's the biggest frustration, is it's a total misdirection, and and it's grist for the mill, because then you get the the debunkers who... Uh, the scientific debunkers, who then glom onto these obvious transparent hoaxes and overgeneralize and say everything's a hoax. You know, everything's misidentified. And, uh, oh, the, the repetition in the skeptical literature. There was a, a paper I just happened to uh, look up because of a, a chapter I'm writing for another book. Invited chapter, and it was a uh, by uh, Nichols, uh, yeah, Joe Nichols, and uh, it was on Bigfoot lookalikes, and the uh, uh, proposing that that all Bigfoot sightings either are either hoaxes or they're misidentified bear encounters, and. Uh, it, uh, uh, yeah, it's just laughable. But the, the constant repetition of these uh, edicts that this was hoaxed, this was fake. The Patterson-Gimlin film, which has been demonstrated to be a hoax. Well, demonstrated by whom? But if you say it often enough, then you convince yourself at least that it's true. And you say it <laughs> with a straight face, I guess, or write it with a straight face. But uh, that, that just baffles me, uh, the source of information. It's like when you when you read a newspaper article, and we were talking about uh, journalistic interviews and so forth, and when you read an article and you see how ridiculously distorted the representation of the facts are about something that you know that you are the primary source, you then stop and wonder, well, how reliable is this article and this article? How are they how accurately have they portrayed this argument when when you see the shortcomings uh, of, of uh, your coverage and uh, so when I read these articles in Skeptical Inquirer I, I have no confidence in any of the other articles and so 
But many of my colleagues read that as a source of information, of, of, of objective, critical thinking, as they see it, when it's nothing, n nothing near that. That's really, and that's that's the frustrating. I mean, I, that's a little ways away from hoaxing, but I tell you, there's a lot of hoaxing going on in the skeptical inquirer. <laughs> well, and that leads me to my a, a question that I wanted to kind of interject on is, if if someone is is proved um, a hoax to be fake, or um, purposefully faked, if that happens enough, then it seems like people stop listening and right. to a certain extent. Oh yeah. You know, I think about the story of the boy who cried wolf. That's right. I feel like we, we kind of begin into this vicious cycle of of these hoaxes that come up, um, things that are easily disproved by quote-unquote professionals, um, whether it be media or whatnot. But when there's something that, like like the Patterson-Gimlin, we're looking at one of these frames up here um, in your office, that is the most uh, powerful evidence, in my opinion, of actual Bigfoot. But if you see how easy people um, can be swayed by the media, it just frustrates the mm -hmm. entire process. And that, for me, personally, just it's upsetting that it happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. It, it's just one of those things that it, it kind of drives me nuts that it actually happens and people actually listen to mm -hmm. it. Well, and it carries over into the scientific literature as well because a debunking story like uh, the hair samples from up in the Yukon that turned out to be muskox, you know, that, that was immediately published. And, uh, but yet if I, ha if I wrote up a paper that enumerated the many different samples of hair that cannot be readily attributed to any common form of wildlife, but that are clearly primate hair, but don't, but have re and have remarkably consistent features that uh, the consistency of which really precludes them from being human hair, let alone the fact that they don't have cut ends and the circumstances in which they were found, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it would never get published. It just would never get published. Um, I even recently had a, a book proposal, uh, an invited proposal. But because the, the book, from, from an academic press, the invitation was received, but because the book uh, asserted to advance evidence suggesting these creatures actually do exist, the development team didn't think they could get it past uh, an external peer review board. And so they, they asked me to revise it to simply examine some of the folklore and, uh, and uh, ethnographic data about wild men around the world. And that they thought they could get through, Interesting. you know. So yeah. it's like, you know, talking about the Patterson-Gimlin film, when it was first examined objectively, I say with air quotes there, um, Again, this prevailing paradigm prevented the experts of the time from even uh, admitting that such a creature could exist. So since it couldn't exist, what's the only conclusion? That it's a hoax. So it must be a hoax. And so they never really evaluated it on its own terms, its own merits. It was, and, and instead, they then saw what they expected to see and picked out things that they thought validated their conclusion that it was a hoax, even though it was so ridiculously misdirected, their, their comments, so many of them. And some of them, uh, in fairness, were just, well, yes, misdirected, I, I still think, covers that. One example, one quick example, because it's, it's such a fun and, well, enlightening example. John Napier, who... Uh, who I have a great deal of respect for, and, and as a primate locomotor uh, anatomist, uh, owe a great deal to because he was really, he and his wife, the father and mother of locomotor studies, primate locomotor studies, and, and uh, had a great deal of influence on the crafting of locomotor categories to describe the ways in which primates move. Anyway, uh, he also had my respect because he was rather open-minded about the possibility 
that something like this might exist, at least willing to look at it relatively objectively, and was one of the first scientists. Well, he was he was amongst the body of scientists at the Smithsonian that examined the Patterson Gilman film when it was first shown to the U.S. scientists at the Smithsonian, and uh, later he wrote a book uh, which examined evidence for the Yeti and, and Sasquatch, and admittedly he had a limited uh, data set to to deal with you know limited number of footprint casts and photos and and other um, encounter data but that book was published in 1973 and in that he talks about his reaction to his viewing of the Patterson Gillen film and he he makes the point that there wasn't any one thing he could really put his finger on to justify a conclusion that it was a hoax but it had to be a hoax and so then, after having, even after having said that, he turns around and he says, when I look at that film subject from the waist up, it looks like an ape. From the waist down, it looks typically human. He said, it's almost inconceivable that such a hybrid of structure could exist in nature. So one or the other would be fake, which means the whole thing's fake. Well, that was 1973. In 1974, the discovery of Lucy Australopithecus afarensis was found. And what did the popular press say? What did the experts say in their interviews? From the waist up, she looks like a chimpanzee. From the waist down, she looks like a human. Isn't it interesting how evolution has progressed in this mosaic fashion, combining traits that we wouldn't have expected to see in combination? Well, if <laughs> Napier had waited just one year before publishing his book, maybe he would have rethought that principle reason for rejecting the film when it actually anticipated by decades actually well in this case in that, on that point by a year uh, what we now understand as the way in which early hominin evolution uh, unfolded and uh, there you know there are dozens of not dozens but there are numerous other examples of such factors of the anatomy and behavior seen on that film that uh, when, when viewed in the context of our current understanding, um, we're actually prescient by decades, anticipated by decades what we now understand. How could Roger Patterson have done that? Or anybody alive at that time in 1967 have concocted something that is so remarkably consistent with our current understanding? You know, and I find that interesting because you know, you mentioned that uh, gentleman who was, you know, it can't be, this this can't be real. This this has to be a hoax. And you have people in the community um, considering evidence like this, and they seem to be more inclined to prove that it's a hoax than to prove that it's true. Mm. And there's a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of resources driven into that instead of, hey, let's prove that this is a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and that's frustrating but you know you mentioned uh, the Patterson film and last year I went to one of your conferences here in Montpelier Idaho um, and you had showed um, a stabilized footage of, of the Patterson Gimlin film mm -hmm. um, on, on I think it was a it was just on repeat mm -hmm. he, you had pointed out a lot of the, the locomotion uh, of the creature uh, muscle flexation um, and a, and a, a a host of other features, um, muscle movement in the back. Mm -hmm. um, there's some kind of uh, um, something on its thigh mm -hmm. that seems to be moving around. And a lot of those things were not available to people when this film originally came out because it's so shaky. And I find it interesting that there's technology available today that really um, enhances the credibility of that film when it was captured 50 years ago. Right. And I find that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, there's no way he could have anticipated the technologies that would have uh, developed to allow us to examine the film in such detail and to dissect it in a way, you know, put it under the microscope, literally, to uh, examine someone just pulling off a hoax would not have had the wherewithal to accomplish that and probably one of the most scrutinized pieces of film next to the Zapruder film mm -hmm. and you know <laughs> lunar landings with regards to 
um, different sightings and different um, stories. You've got shelves of books that have these different stories. Um, is there any evidence that points to the government not wanting to admit that this is a real thing right. or, or that there might be an outright cover-up? Well, the my experience has been that the the that there is no widespread conspiracy. I've seen no evidence of that. What I experience are individual reactions, not institutional reactions. And and those seem to take principally two forms. One is a concern for one's individual reputation, professional reputation and credibility. And two a heightened sense of or sense of and two a heightened sensitivity to any perception of the misuse of public funds so if it's a federal or government type agency a state agency then um, fish and game or forest service or u.s fish and wildlife park service they are concerned about any audit <laughs> of their time and, and resources and, and don't see a reasonable justification to be searching for a mythological creature that, that isn't uh, thought to exist. So I've, I've had experiences with uh, individuals who are very curious, very interested, and very supportive, and we've had cooperation and uh, opportunities to disseminate information afforded by state and federal agencies. I've given presentations at uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife offices. I've talked with park rangers extensively and uh, both on and off the record. And, um, you know, no men in black have showed up at my lab to <laughs> rifle through my files or confiscate my footprint cast. So either I'm, I'm disseminating sufficient disinformation <laughs> to satisfy them or I'm uh, or just spinning my wheels which is satisfying them or I'm uh, I have enough notoriety that any any such uh, assault would draw too much attention to their activities and so therefore I'm off limits I'm I'm, I'm too hot <laughs> I don't I don't see any <laughs> any justification for either of those conclusions quite honestly so yeah, thank you, thank you for answering the question because it's <laughs> it's something that comes up. Oh yeah, um, and there's there's different stories from different angles of you know people showing up and stuff happening. So, um, but again, you know, it's all on a we're going off of your experience and what you think. So right, really appreciate you um, answering that. And I didn't mean to ask, ask that with bated breath. Oh no no, <laughs> well no it's and it is. Uh, you know, you, you 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 do wonder every once in a while. I mean, you hear these stories about uh, body, bodies being carted off in in vehicles, you know, after a fire or something like that. But um, I I don't see any any evidence of that. Uh, but uh, no, but what I do experience suggests that there is no real central policy you know coming down from higher administration it's more now i mean there's, there's, there's a few interesting sort of titillating uh, possibilities like uh, you know the map that a paratrooper has that shows dangerous forms of wildlife that that might be encountered and there's a picture of a sasquatch um whether that's tongue-in-cheek you know uh, or what i mean there was a case where um somebody who was doing an environmental impact report listed amongst the species potentially impacted Sasquatch. And it was done tongue in cheek, you know, and it drew attention to the whole process. And unfortunately, maybe not in the way that individual had hoped attention would be focused. But um, so I think, you know, I never know whether those kind of things are done out of a conscious acknowledgement that they're out there and that 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 there is some spoken written or unwritten policy of behavior or, or response or reaction or if it's just uh hey this would be kind of there's a blank spot on the map there let's put a sasquatch picture <laughs> I, right. I honestly don't know yeah and that's 
And that's okay, because I mean, that's that's the lens that all of us have to look exactly. through things, is our, our personal experience. I mean, we do have a vast ability to, to reach out and grab information and assess it, but right. we're not there, and we're not those people, right? you know? So I think that's the best that we can do, uh, provided that. Yeah. Um, you talked about citizens uh, scientists. Aside from that, is there anything else that you'd like to see happen in the Bigfoot community? That's a loaded question because there's it spans, you know, all sorts of walks of life and right. ideologies and right. conclusions. Well, <clears throat> I mean, there are things that I would when it, it, the way you phrase that there are things within the Bigfoot community or things under the umbrella of the question of the existence, the investigation of the question of the existence of Sasquatch. I mean, certainly I would prefer within the Bigfoot community to see less grasping at straws in the form of paranormal explanations, which in many instances, and I realize people have personal experiences and and they, those are highly subjective and open to a wide range of interpretation. Um, and I've tried to maintain an open mind and, and I have, uh, I've even taken people up on their invitation to go out to experience such uh, phenomenon, uh, only to have nothing happen. So I'm, I, you know, I, I'm the, not the life of the party, I guess, when it comes to that wet blanket, um, or I have a bad, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to laugh, but I, I was at a, a, a paranormal conference here recently, um, as just as a, a guest appearance and, and, and helping to man, um, another group's table, um, to further their objectives. But a woman came up to the table and she's looking and she's asking a few questions and she goes, you'll never find them. You'll never find them. They're they're highly intelligent beings that exist on, on uh, uh, you know, on, on a different plane. They're they're transdimensional, interdimensional beings, and they don't gravitate to people of lower frequency. And I go, oh, that's my problem. How do I raise my frequency? <laughs> And I, you know, there was a, there was a modicum of sincerity in that remark too. I was really curious. I mean, if she, how she was going to, and she just looked at me and turned and walked away. <laughs> so I guess, I guess I wasn't convincing of that uh, sincerity, but uh, <laughs> I'm willing, you know, I'm uh, no stone unturned, yeah. no reasonable stone unturned. But, but as I said, my experience has been. Uh, that these experiences, these uh, these claims of extraordinary paranormal experiences, they're not replicable. And, uh, you know, when I'm shown a picture of orbs, it's pollen blowing around in the air with a flash on the camera illuminating all these little orbs of light. Um, when, uh, you know, when someone hears a inexplicable... Um, whoop or bump in the night sometimes, you know, and that's not that paranormal, but, uh, you know, it turns out to be a common form of wildlife uh, in many instances, not in every, but in many. So that's one, obviously, the Bigfoot community, but I guess if, if there were others, it would be if, if, if the stigma could be lifted, the if we could get past the sort of tabloid perception of uh, particularly of the 70s sort of I and mean, that seemed to be the heyday when when national Enquirer and similar types of tabloids you know i was just looking in fact the other day someone had posted a whole bunch of covers of some of these tabloid magazines you know i was bigfoot's love slave and <laughs> i gave birth to the first baby bigfoot and etc um that that would be one thing and we were talking earlier about laura krantz and her podcasts and 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 a palpable sense of a very different attitude by the media towards her coverage of this subject matter, which may bode for some change from that, some deviation from that stigma. I think the other kind of things I would like to see changed are uh, 
you know, furtherance of, of these um, new technologies. Uh, and, and by that, uh, to facilitate that, the, the uh, participation and contribution from interested parties who have the wherewithal, since the funding is not going to come through uh, other than private sources, private foundations or individuals, um, to further along that, um, that line of research. Um, I would like to see the evidence be given a, a fair shake. You know, we're trying to accomplish that through things like the Relic Hominoid Inquiry to provide a scholarly platform, a venue by which papers addressing this subject matter can, uh, can, can find an audience, hopefully. But, but the problem is getting the audience, getting the, the audience I would like to see reading that material and they have, have no way really to gauge. Some of those papers are being cited though in the literature, the scientific, the mainstream scientific literature. So that's a good sign. Um, but those are the types of things. I mean, we've, we've been talking about the, the, the Patterson-Gimlet film, how that, uh, I would like to see a t a re us reach a point where that shadow cast by previous paradigms and dogmas um, is, escaped and in in the light of day we can clearly and objectively perhaps with a new generation of up-and-coming anthropologists and biologists and and such um, give that evidence a, a more objective consideration i mean i think we're right now we're kind of at a stalemate even if those things happen unless there is some very compelling photographic evidence but even better yeah, because of the technologies that we'd have to contend with. Um, a DNA or a skeletal fragment, you know, if someone walked in with a molar tooth, giant molar tooth, that would that would change the playing field. That would change change the circumstances entirely. Yeah, so those are those are some of the things. It's really interesting because we have uh, you know, you have hair samples dung samples and however many foot casts that's those are some pretty heavy evidences they are, they are. you know you know the the big public fascination with the abominable snowman back in the heyday of the mountaineering expeditions to conquer everest and at that time although there was some keeping the the cards close to the vest there were a good half dozen scientists who were talking about the sas uh, the yeti rather uh in in the scientific literature and nature even published which is you know the flagship journal published an article by an, an anatomist who had attempted to reconstruct or model rather a foot that would fit the footprint from photographed by eric shipton and and uh, he discussed all the interpretation of the anatomy and the implications from an anthropological and evolutionary morphology perspective, and it was published in Nature magazine. Um, and yet, we have, you know, just a modicum of, of, of uh, data. Uh, there's only a couple, two or three interesting footprints that, that support a hominoid hypothesis for the Yeti, as opposed to the more popular now, the bear hypothesis. Um, uh, and the efforts to shovel that over onto the Sasquatch phenomenon now. But by comparison, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of substantial information. One of my past department chairs accosted me at one point. And he said, well, after all, Jeff, these are just stories. And I said, well, just stories that leave footprints, that shed hair, that void scat, that vocalize, that are seen by objective, uh, sometimes very experienced eyewitnesses. I said, it's a lot more than just stories. If it was just stories, then as a physical anthropologist, I couldn't justify my, my professional preoccupation with this question, unless I was you know, a cultural anthropologist or a folklorist or something like that, dealing with the phenomenon of stories. But um, you know, that was a conclusion drawn, never having set foot in my laboratory. <laughs> One of my other colleagues who was a good friend of that, that chairman, uh, took him to task over that. 
How can you draw a conclusion? How can you as a scientist draw a conclusion when you've never even engaged the primary data? You've never set foot in his lab. You've never looked at his, at his footprint cast. And he said, you probably haven't read one of his articles either, have you? No. It's interesting how that plays out. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your evening to, to meet with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we went down a lot of different paths there. Sure. I feel like we, we kind of gathered the strings at the end there and pulled that in nice and neat. And um, is there anything else you want to put out there right here at the end? Uh, go buy my book. Go buy your book. Yeah, <laughs> plug the book. Plug the book for sure. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, that's, and people often ask me, and, and I, in fact, just the other day had a, a, a newbie, a novice in, uh, enthusiast who is very, very interested now in the subject, and, and that was the first question. What should I read? Well, and for those of you out there who haven't, who are interested in this subject, a good starting point, I think, is uh, my book, as well as books like those by John Bindernagel and Dr. Grover Krantz and, uh, you know, other individuals, other PhDs who have taken the time and effort to, to uh, write a treatment of uh, this subject from an objective affirmative. Now, there's a few PhDs on the other side that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you read now, but later maybe. Um, and then also, in the, in the vein of citizen science, my field guide, the Sasquatch field guide, which, which was motivated um, by questions that I continually receive, like how do you take a, a picture of, a good picture of, of, a, of a footprint, you know, with scale in the photo? How do you make a footprint cast? What should I do with this hair? Do you want this scat sample, etc.? So that's a great tool, a resource that I think uh, has had a, a very positive impact um, and, and is widely distributed now. I mean, it's always gratifying when I walk into an, uh, a bookstore or an outdoor equipment shop or, um, or a park, you know, something like that, and find the field guide there on the counter. So that's another way. And those can be found on Amazon. Great. Great. We'll uh, link those up in the description of this show to help you out. Yeah. Kind of point some, put some pointers out there for you. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's to help other people out. I mean, I, yes. I, it's a modicum of return for me. It's not. Uh, academic books are not money makers. <laughs> so don't, don't have that delusion that because I've written a book, I'm, you know, I'm spending my, my summers on the <laughs> south of France. Or, but it's... It's a, I'm an educator, and so it's right. a way to put reliable information and useful information out uh, as a resource and tool for those that are interested. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You have a good evening. Thank you. Well, folks, that wraps it up for Dr. Meldrum. We really appreciate him taking the time to meet with us, and we appreciate you listening. We have an exciting show coming up for you next week. It's still in the works. Stay tuned.